What's up, everybody? Again, it is a joy to be with you and a joy to be able to come to you even at this particular hour and this time. Again, I thank God for all of you. Appreciate y'all so much. Um, I know that those of you that are logging on, listen, go ahead and let's share, let's like, let's make sure we comment tonight. Um, share this live with somebody. There is going to be a blessing that I believe that somebody is going to witness and experience because of their faithfulness to God and even likewise their need for God. So again, thank God for all of you. Appreciate you so much. Um, I'm, I'm really at a place right now that I'm excited about how this series has been going. And I want to make sure that everyone uh, receives and gets all of the information of this uh, from this, um, uh, these lessons um, within their spirits that they really apply them. Um, from the first week, we're talking about the prayer um, even as much as last week and even asking pointed questions and even on tonight again we're looking forward to a great time and a great time that we should share um, in this time of gathering as we begin to study um, the fact that there is a better way uh, go ahead put that in the comments somebody just shout that out loud in the comments say it's a better way there is a better way uh, Jesus said he's the way the truth and the life but there is a better way. So let's make sure that we tune in and get connected. Let's go ahead and get your notepad, get all of what you need so that you can be ready to receive what you need to receive because it's going to be an amazing time of study on tonight. Also, those of you uh, that are tuning in, logging on right now, let's go ahead, let's connect. Let's pay our tithes. Let's go ahead and give our offerings. The information is right there on the screen. Um, some like to sow at the beginning. Some want to hear what has to be said before they sow. Uh, listen. Trust me in this, that whatever you do and how you give, it shall be credited to your account. God is looking for your connectedness. Uh, that's a word. Uh, God is looking for your, your commitment. And God is looking forward to you being a part of what it is that he's doing in the earth realm. It is my prayer and it's my hope and desire that we'll say the same prayer together. That God, whatever you're doing in heaven, let it also manifest itself right here on earth. And one of the ways that that can happen is by way of our sacrifice and our giving and our support of what it is that God is doing. So again, I thank God for all of you. Listen, I want you to do that right now. Go ahead and take our time, pay your tithes, go ahead and give your offering. As we get ready to get into this word, it's going to be an amazing time. It's going to be a great, amazing opportunity for us to share a better way, a better way. Um, tonight, um, again, we've been in this series, but tonight is going to be very special because I feel it's very significant as to where we are and where we are right now. We're going through so much, dealing with so much, uh, contending with so much, and even more so now, more than ever, have we been living a distracted life. A distracted, living a distracted life. Now, um, there's a better way, though, and let me go ahead and give... A little backdrop of where we've been. Some of you are just joining us um, in the beginning um, um, right now. Find out, I found out that a better way where we're learning how we as followers of Jesus can learn not just to understand the things that Jesus said, but we can also learn how he lived and how he lived it a better way. I want you to walk with me. Today we're going to be asking the question, how do we live with a uncluttered pursuit of God by way of his mission? I mean, how do we live with an uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? It's, it's, it's clearly there that we got to be uncluttered. We have to not be distracted. We have to make sure that our focus is what our focus is supposed to be. And that's a great question that you have to have. How do we live with an uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? A great question because how do we live with an uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? Well, if we take our time and we go ahead and we look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. And I want you to capture this. Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. And it says this. It says, therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I want you to grab a hold of this. A weird question um, has 
Has, has anyone, let me ask this question, has anyone ever been physically <laughs> entangled by something? Has anybody, anybody, um, in the comments, just put yes or put your hand up. Has anybody ever been entangled by something? I know what uh, Will and Jada talked about. I ain't talking about that. I'm talking about how, uh, y'all know, your mind went straight to entanglement, and I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about physically entangled with something. See, when, when you were kids, you used to play um, 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 double dutch, or uh, some of us played, you know, tetherball, um, or some of us had certain games that you played in tug of war with ropes, and, and you were walking around um, um, in the double dutch, or even as much as trying to do the double dutch, you know, y'all, y'all know how it is, you know, you used to probably, you know, all kind of things, you know, tapping the floor, clap your hands, backward flips, and all that kind of stuff, but you had to make sure that the person who was turning the rope knew how to turn the rope. Y'all ain't talking to me. Hear me, Reese. Uh, you had to make sure somebody that was turning the rope right, and if they didn't turn the rope right, you will get all entangled up in the rope because they didn't do their part, right? Well, well, uh, your feet get caught up in the cord, you get caught up, and then all of a sudden you'll fall down to the ground you got physically held down by the rope that you got entangled with. Watch this, y'all. It's so funny that, that, you know, you know, that it happened, but it's also not funny because that is happening to some of you right now. I want you to hear me. Um, maybe you started messing with things that seemed to be harmless and it got you all entangled. So funny it happened, but it's not funny because this is what sin has done to us. Y'all hear me today. It's what sin has done to us. The exact same thing sin has done to us. Things you thought you would be able to handle. Maybe you started trying a substance with a friend or just clicking on that one site one time or another. And you found out it wasn't fine, it wasn't that not that bad as you thought at the beginning. You thought you was able to handle it. You thought you could get away with it. You thought you could, you know, I ain't really hooked on it yet. But then all of a sudden, you found yourself getting entangled in it. And when you got entangled in it, you found yourself getting stuck. And when you found yourself getting stuck, you found yourself being held down. Let me tell you something. I want y'all to hear me clearly today. God is calling you to his mission. He's calling you to his mission but you can't move forward because you're entangled. He's calling you to his purpose, but you can't move forward because you're entangled. Maybe, maybe for some of you, um, it might not be sin on your behalf because it's not just our sin that has the ability to hinder us. It's not just sin that stops you. It's not only just sin that hinders you, but, but if we take it back to the text and let us just lay aside, the Bible says, let us lay aside every weight, every weight, and the sin that so easily ensnares or entangles us. Maybe for you, and hear me, hear me clearly today, you're not doing anything bad, but your entanglement may be that you are just too busy. Okay. Ah, uh, here we go, Bishop. Yeah, here we go. If God called you to do something right now, God asked of you to do something right now, you have no space on your calendar to do anything for God because you are just too busy. Yeah, go get that person right now. They, they, they busy. They so busy, they couldn't even get, get online today and watch a, 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 a Bible study. They, they're just so busy. They got so much going on. They're doing so much. Uh, uh, they're grinding. They're hustling. They're on their way. But you're just too busy that God can't even call you to do something. You operating in your busyness, but you're not operating in the blessedness of God. I think I made up a word. Y'all hear what I'm saying? 
that, that, that there, maybe, maybe, maybe for you, you just, your entanglement might just be your comfortability. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, God, I want to follow you, but, 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 uh, you know, you know, I'm good. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm good where I am. I'm good where I'm at. I'm good. We have gotten to a place that even one thing that I didn't see coming, that we've gotten to the place that we're so comfortable that we've lost our calling. We're so comfortable that we have, have detached ourselves from what it is that God is asking of us to do. Hear me. I'm, I'm good where I'm at. I'm, 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 I'm good with my friends. I'm good with my life. Like, like I'm fine. It's, it's good. I'm all right. I'm all right. And you're settling for something that is good when you don't even know what you're missing out is something that is great. Don't you ever get to the place that you're so comfortable with just being good when great is available. Can I say that again? Do not become comfortable with what is good when great is available. Did you hear what I said? I want you to capture this. Maybe for you, maybe that's, that's, that's what's hindering you. Maybe that's what's stopping you. Maybe that's what's holding you back. Maybe that's causing you to miss out because, because um, um, here it is, here it is. Um, what God has for you is sometimes at a place that may bother you because it deals with you. See, maybe what's hindering you and holding you back from God is what you have experienced yourself, the hurt, the pain, the rejection. Hurts that you haven't healed from have become your entanglement. Pain of your past has become your entanglement. Rejection has become your entanglement. The lack of support has become your entanglement. So you're suffering through the hurt. You're suffering through the pain. Maybe you're still stuck in a lie that you believed in by yourself. Maybe, maybe it's unforgiveness that God is calling you forward, but, but you just can't let go. It's amazing, it's amazing. People, God, and I can say, I can say if you find yourself in this place where you, where you feel like you're stuck, you feel like you're hindered, um, you feel like you're entangled, um, that from that experience, I know this is not the life that God has for you to live. Trust me when I tell you this, that I'm not only speaking this by way of being a preacher and, and being a pastor. I'm speaking of this because I've been the recipient. I've been the client. I've been the one who's been in that same mind, mindset and that, that, that frame of thought. I've been there and I'm saying it from experience. That's not the life that God wants you to live. God needs you to let, let some things go. You, you, you're so busy entangled with some stuff that you can't even be you. There's a better way. There's a better way because Jesus did not die for you so that you'll be stuck. He didn't die for you so that you'll be entangled. He died for you so that you can live. No, oh, no, no. He wanted to set you free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And capture this. I love what it says in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verse number one. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Maybe for you, you're desperate for this freedom, or maybe you're not. Maybe for some of you, you're still holding on because it's like, no, I, 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 I can't handle it. I can't deal with it. Like, like, like I, I can have Jesus and this, and it's fine. Can I have Jesus and that? Can I walk with him in this? Can I live for Jesus and live for that? I mean, can I just say from experience that it's really hard 
to fully follow Jesus is hard. It's hard to follow Jesus when my hands are full. <laughs> it's hard to, hard to really handle Jesus when, when I'm trying to juggle everything else that I'm doing. So what do we do? Come on, talk to me, Bishop. How do we get through this? How do we throw off everything that hinders us? How do we get past this? How do we get out of this situation? We, we confess to God for forgiveness, but we confess to uh, other people for healing. We confess to God for forgiveness, but we confess to other people for healing. It makes me start to think about something. It made me think about this man by the name of Lazarus. Who was Lazarus? Well, Lazarus was one of Jesus' friends in whom he loved very dearly. I mean, he, he, when he spent time, he spent time, when he was away from the people healing the sick and all that kind of stuff, he hung out with Lazarus. He was, he was there with him. But, but, but tragically, while Jesus is doing ministry and he's away, tragically, Lazarus dies. And when Lazarus dies, four days later, somebody say four days later in the comments, four days later, Jesus shows up on the scene and people are in grief. They're grieving by the tomb of Lazarus. And God moved Jesus and moved, in, moved him in compassion for Lazarus and the people around him. In, and he moved him into a place of tears. He says, Jesus says, roll the stone away. And then Jesus does something radical. Jesus does something supernatural. Jesus does something that is a picture of what was getting ready to happen or what he was getting ready to do. He calls Lazarus out of the tomb from, from death to life. Not from life to death. He calls him from the tomb from place of death back to life. From darkness into light. Walk with me, y'all. And in that moment, Lazarus, who was dead, is now alive. From death to life. Only Jesus has the ability to do it from death to life. And only Jesus can bring life, can bring salvation. But, but, but as he steps out of the tomb, Lazarus, as Lazarus steps out the tomb, there's a problem. Because he's still is wrapped in grave clothing. Come here, y'all, walk with me. He's still entangled, if you will. He's still hindered by the things that was holding him back before. And Jesus, seeing this, turns to his followers and says, let him go. They go um, um, and they unbind Lazarus. He's now free to move forward into the life and the calling that Jesus has for him. Y'all walk with me? Here's, here's what's shocking. Is, isn't it true that for some of us, Jesus has given you a new life, but you're still bound in grave clothing? Jesus has given you a newness of life. He's given you a better way, but you still are entangled with what it was that you were before he came into your life. Y'all, y'all, you're here with me. Oh, oh, listen, listen, y'all, we're still hindered, and that's why, that's why, that's why community is so important. That's the reason why having the right people around you is so vitally important. I, and, and, and can I just say that when, when we let our stay, ourselves stay hindered, when we allow ourselves to stay stuck, when we allow ourselves to stay entangled, uh, that not only are we missing out on all that God has for us, but we become this, this, this roadblock to everyone that's coming up behind us. I want you to hear me, hear me clearly. There's some people that want to get there. Some people want to look to you and see you as an example that they can model and follow and operate like. But here it is. You still are carrying grave clothes that you should have let go of a long time ago. And you're in, still entangled. So what happens is you hinder their growth because your growth has been stunted and stuck. So how do we live? How do we live? 
How do we live an uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? How do we live knowing that what has happened before in our lives no longer is the guiding rod or even the, the barometer that measures where we can go and where we cannot go? I'm telling you right now, God has set you free. And because God has set you free, all entanglements need to be released out of your life, even now as I speak. Hear me, hear me. So how do we live? How do we live this uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? Well, number one, this is what you got to do. Throw off everything that hinders you. Get rid of everything that's been hindering you. Get rid of it. But that's not where we stop. That's not where we, that's not where we remain. Get, get rid of it. Get rid of it. That's not, where that's not where the verse stops. If we go back to uh, the Hebrew text in chapter 12, the author says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles us. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Perseverance perseverance how do we live this uncluttered pursuit of God's mission perseverance oh God we throw off everything that hinders us what do we do we got to run with perseverance oh push your way through there Push your way through. I'm telling y'all right now, push your way through whatever it is that you got to go through, whatever it is that you got. Listen, push your way through. T take off everything that has, that's bringing hindrance. Throw off or throw away everything that's been stopping you and press your way through that thing. Yeah, persevere, persevere. But here's the thing about perseverance. It's difficult. Perseverance is difficult it's hard to do it perseverance is is painful uh-huh um, perseverance is difficult and in fact the author of Hebrews goes on in the same chapter to talk about pain of discipline and the pain of perseverance Later down, we'll see where he says in verse number 11, watch this, he says, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. And nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Verse 12, he says, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet so that what is lame may not be dislocated but be rather healed. Oh God. Um, no discipline is easy, but it's, it's painful. I don't know if you've ever been to the gym. Oh, I mean, it looks good when, you know, when you're real fit. But, but know that there's been a series and even a continued series of soreness and pain. Oh, it's difficult, y'all. When, when you're lifting weights, um, um, it's, not an, it's not an easy task. It's not something that you wake up and say, I really want to go beat my body up physically uh, just so I can look better or even feel better. It's amazing, so, so oxymoronic that, that I got to go through all this pain. No one woke up and said, God, please let me go through another global pandemic. Nobody says that. Nobody says, nobody says, you know, let me do it. So I'm going to go through this so I can learn to grow um, and, and, and learn to, to, to obtain what I'm supposed to obtain again. Listen, y'all, you're not hoping. No one's praying, God, please make that co-worker even more difficult at my job, huh? So I could learn how to love the unlovable. Nobody's asking for these type of prayers. Nobody's saying, God, you know, you're hoping that your marriage gets harder and harder, but in fact, it's difficult because no one wants to have to persevere through anything. Perseverance. 
Perseverance is, is, is painful again. So much so that I think if you're thinking anything like me, perseverance even seems like an option sometimes. <laughs> to persevere sometimes appears to be optional. Sometimes you want to quit even before you hit a roadblock. Someone's are ready to throw in the towel when you automatically start to see glimpses of it possibly not working. The reason why we get out the gym so quick and we don't go back is because we didn't see immediate results. Because perseverance doesn't call for immediate results. Perseverance calls for consistency and commitment. That sometimes we feel that's optional. I ain't got to get up this morning and do it. I ain't got to get up the next morning and do it. It's my choice. Sometimes you want to quit before you hit the robot because the running of the race is just too difficult. How many times you started and stopped? How many times you went and never went back? How many times you should be doing this, but you're not doing it? You're not as consistent as you should be. So how do we do this? How do we, Bishop, how do we persevere? Give us an answer on this. How do we, how do we push forward in this? I mean, even, even in this whole pandemic, how are we supposed to push forward after all of what we've been through? All of what we're like, man, I'm trying to get an understanding on how we're supposed to push. Well, well, when you're tempted to stop, you have to remember why you started. When you're tempted to stop, you got to remember why you started. You, when, when, you, when you're tempted to throw in the towel, when you're tempted to give up on that loved one, on the family member, or to quit your job, or, or, or you got to remember why you started in the first place. Oh, I constantly have to remind myself as to why I'm, I'm doing this. Because I got to remember why I started in the first place. And if I don't remember, and if I don't keep it in my mind, then it will be easy for me to move to the option of quitting. Come here. For you, for you, and for me, there's a race that you're wanting to give up on even right now. There's something in you that you're supposed to be doing, but you're willing and have given it a thought of quitting right now because it's just getting too difficult becoming too difficult and it's it's the job that you're in or or um and and that job has given you so much tension y'all can raise your hand in the comments they're not watching how many y'all right now know the job is getting on your last nerve i don't have it in me I don't have it in me to continue to, to continue keep doing this. And as a matter of fact, sometimes we get into that place, especially when we start to work on what we're more passionate in. And you start seeing the growth of it. You start seeing the, the movement of it. And then you still have to then shift your mind back to your job. But you know you can't just leave the job because where you are passionate in has not produced the dividends it needs to be able to produce your growth and your life. So I got to still stay here. But I'm telling you, I understand where your perseverance starts to, starts to wean away. You start to wonder, God, I don't know if I want to continue doing this. The job, and there's just so much tension. But you got to try to remember why you started. Why you started that career in the first place? Why did you start doing that in the first place? And for many of you, it, it, it might be your dad. It was your mom. It was a sibling. It was a family member who hurt you but the race is set before you is to restore the relationship with those loved ones. You feel like giving up. You feel like stopping. You feel like throwing in a towel. You feel like it, but you know you got to go ahead and persevere. I got to restore this. It's only right 
This is my blood. This is my family. This is the one who I know and who I love and who I will always cherish in my life. I have to restore it. I have to restore it. Remember why you started on that journey of forgiveness in the first place. Yeah, and a lot of people don't want to talk about that too much. I need to go ahead and jump on a series on forgiveness because a lot of us don't want to talk about that. But why did you jump on the train called forgiveness in the first place? You got to remember why you started it. Remember why you started. Then you can persevere. Am I losing y'all? Come here, come here. I, I think the best example for us is the exact idea is Jesus in the Bible. Watch this, y'all. He's about to die in a few moments. Jesus in the Bible. He's on a cross, and he knows what's coming. He understands the brutality of death is coming towards his way. And that he's, he's, he's praying in the garden, and this is what he says, God, if you can take this cup of suffering away from me, if you can rid me of this moment of agony and not having to go through this, I will do it. But then he turns around and says, but not my will, but your will be done. You got to hear that, people of God. You got to understand that. I mean, I mean, in his, in his final moments, Jesus remembered why he started the race and what he came to earth to do in the first place. Not for his will, but for God's will to be done. For his glory. For yours and ours and my salvation, he's, do, he's doing it. To restore the relationship with us and with God, he's doing it. I mean, it's, it's, it's us and him. He remembered why he started the race. So he was able to persevere even to death. Death on a cross. He persevered. Oh, I love this, y'all. How do we live an undistracted, uncluttered, unentangled pursuit of God's mission. One, we throw off everything that hinders us. Throw it off. Somebody put that in the comments. Throw it off. Throw it off. Throw it off. Huh. Two, we run the race with perseverance. Painful, but I'm going to do it anyway. Hurtful, but I'm going to do it anyway. I can't stand them, but I'm going to do it anyway. Perseverance. Then the last thing that we do is we fix our eyes on Jesus. We fix our eyes on Jesus. Go back to verse, uh, chapter 12, starting at verse 1. Therefore also, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. What is it that your eyes are fixed on? What are you looking at? What are you watching? What are you paying attention to? Where are you focused? What has actually captured your attention? Where are you at? Well, well, because when our eyes are fixed on anything, other than Jesus, it would, it would inevitably move us away or literally lead us away from Jesus. It would distract us. If you have children, you have, you have to give them your undivided attention. You got to look at them. You got to talk with them. Um, it's not too long um, before for, for the, um, they, 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 the winds get up. Uh, they start getting into danger. They start doing different things. And I, and I get into trouble because they be climbing on things, jumping off things, doing all kinds. I mean, come on, y'all. We know our children, right? Now, the same way that is for us to give our children our undivided attention to keep them safe, as followers of Christ, listen, if we ever find ourselves at a place or in a situation where we've taken our eyes off Jesus, we're going to find ourselves in a place of frustration. Frustrated because of all the crazy clutter that's, that's all around it, the, the distractions of life. But, 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 but in that, instead of just actually following Jesus into a better way of living and following Jesus to a better way of thinking, he wants to lead us and we get caught up Along the journey, when you allow him to lead you, you get caught up in the journey. 
and seeing where God wants you to go. But there is a moment in Jesus' ministry where he and his disciples, they're going with him to Jerusalem, right? And as they're going with him to Jerusalem, it's actually right before, he's, he, 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 before this that, that he pulled all of his disciples to tell them, hey, when we get to Jerusalem, I'm actually going to be there and I'm going to die there. But on the way, James and John come to Jesus and they ask him a question. Because James and John at this particular point had their eyes fixed on what they wanted Jesus to do for them. He's on his way. He's already given them a prequel of the fact that when I get here, I'm going to die. I'm, I'm, I'm getting ready to leave from here. And, and James and John decide that they want to come to Jesus with a question on the road as they're on their way. Because they were convinced that Jesus, when he arrived in Jerusalem, he would show up to kick out all the religious leaders just as much as everybody else thought. They thought Jesus was on a campaign trail, that Jesus had an agenda, that Jesus was coming in there to really kind of just wreak havoc on the Roman Empire to overthrow the Roman Empire and to install a new government with Jesus as king. And these disciples, as prominent and influential politicians, but, but, but that's not what it was that Jesus was going to do. Or at least that's what they had expected that he was going to do. So they come to Jesus with a question. This is what they say. Hey, will you do for us whatever we ask you to do? And Jesus asked a wise question in response. What is it that you want me to do for you? And so James, John, asked Jesus, huh, well, can we sit on your right and on your left when you come into your glory? <laughs> What James and John had their eyes fixed on was not Jesus' mission, but it was their mission, their desire, their hope. You don't walked with me this whole time. And when I come to you about this and I come to you communicating this, when I come to you discussing this, when I come to you uh, dialoguing with you about what it is and I'm getting ready to go through and what I'm getting ready to do as my mission, your purpose of your dialogue with me is to see where you fit in, put you in a place of prominence, set up a particular seat for you and you, for you, James, or for you, John, how many people God? Listen, their eyes were not fixed on what God wanted to do through them, but Jesus, what Jesus could do for them. Their eyes were fixed on gaining position and power for themselves. How many times people only come to Christ because they see it as an opportunity to gain a level of influence, to gain a level of power, to get them a seat, to gain a sense of, of what Jesus can do for them if they just witness the right way or uh, function the right way or rub shoulders with the right people or network with the right folk or get around the right in crowd so I can be positioned for greater things because all I really want is not a changed life but a higher life than what I'm living. Their eyes are fixed on gaining position and power. How often we do the same thing? How often in your relationship with Jesus that sometimes your nights of prayer was not about what you have done wrong and what you needed correct, but more so your prayer was more so bent on what he can do for you. Jesus, I need you, I need you to give me that money so I can pay that bill. <laughs> Come on. 
Come on, no, 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 don't hang up now. Come on, come on, right, come on. Stay on, stay on line with me. Jesus, you know how I, I, I want that car real bad. If you could just, just help me get that car. You haven't thought about your money management. You haven't thought about your sacrifice. You have not thought about uh, what you need to change in your life to make yourself better. You ain't thought about your attitude. You ain't thought about character. You ain't talked about integrity. You ain't talked about nothing in that prayer time. You just want God to do. God is a vending machine for you. My prayer tonight, A1, give me that. Right? That's all it is. Swipe your card. You think all of a sudden you're supposed to get something. No, 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 no. Listen, y'all. We're in a relationship with Jesus. And instead of just enjoying his presence and loving to be around him, to know that you got a relationship with him, to know that he's there with you through thick and thin, we find ourselves chasing after all the things that we want from him rather than enjoying him. No, I enjoy him. I enjoy him. No, if you enjoyed him, then you don't mind taking an hour and 30 minutes just to sit with him and worship on a Sunday, even online. I don't know, no, 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 but it's just, you know, no, 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 no. Y'all enjoy football games, you enjoy basketball games. You enjoy mall and entertainment and concerts. You enjoy shopping. You don't enjoy Jesus. No, you don't enjoy him. Because if you enjoyed him, you would bask in his presence. If you enjoyed him, you would read that word and study it and learn of him. If you enjoyed him, you would do that. You, watch it. you would persevere with him oh God Jesus would be condemned to crucifixion Jesus would be beaten he would be spit on he would be mocked there would be a crown of thorns placed on his head a rugged wooden cross placed on his back and he would be told to carry the cross and carry it up a hill called Golgotha or Calvary he will be doing this and watch this y'all he had to do it all by himself where were you at James and John the sons of Zebedee where were you at the one who wanted to sit on the right and on the left but when he had to carry the cross you was nowhere to be found Earlier in Jesus' ministry, he had told everyone that if you want to be my follower, it's going to come with a cost. And the cost is this. To be my follower, you must be willing to deny yourself. Let me say it again. To be a follower of Christ is to deny yourself. Watch this, y'all. And take up your cross and follow me. That's what he said. But when Jesus had to carry the cross up Calvary's hill, where were you? Where were y'all at? But as Jesus carried across Calvary, none of the disciples are with him. So a new Simon needed to be called. We're told in Mark's gospel, I want you to capture this, a certain man from Cyrene named Simon. Isn't it ironic? That when Peter, whose name is Simon Barjona, huh, Simon denies him three times and Jesus picks up another Simon to carry a cross. <laughs> Y'all ain't got this yet. Huh? Simon was, was called to carry Jesus' cross up to Calvary. And this is what's so fascinating about this moment is that that, that was supposed to be Simon and Peter carrying the cross. But it was Simon of Cyrene. 
Simon Peter was the one that was meant to carry the cross up the Calvary with Jesus because Simon Peter was Jesus' God. Simon Peter was the one that went up to the mountain of transfiguration and saw Jesus change. Simon Peter was the one who cut the ear off for Jesus in the garden, cut the ear off of the, of the soldier of Je- for Jesus in the garden. Simon Peter is the one who says, you ain't going to die. No, not Simon Peter was the one that was the ride or die. But where was he when Jesus was carrying the cross? His eyes was fixed on protecting himself, that he missed his opportunity to be with Jesus in one of the most painful and most dark moments of his ministry. And how often do we do the same thing? I hope y'all hearing me tonight. I hope y'all listening to me tonight because a lot of us are at that same place. A lot of us are in that same vein. A lot of us are going through the same thing where, where there's something that God wants us to do, but our eyes are so fixed on trying to stay safe. We, say, we stay safe. We stay clear of things. We stay out of, uh, out of things because we don't want to lose certain friendships and certain associates we don't want to be disconnected but I'm telling you right now you lose a whole opportunity altogether I want you to hear me today what is that thing for you that's keeping you away from where God wants you to be is there something that where you felt the prompting of God to do something and you're not doing it you were supposed you're supposed to step out on faith to reach out to someone in need, to do that thing that scares you. People got to show up for somebody in a situation where you're having um, um, to weigh out the odds. Do I love my neighbor or do I protect my reputation? Do I care for these people or do I protect my reputation? Instead of doing what was right, you uh, you chose to do what made you look good. We all are guilty of that. You performed in a way that made you look good. (laughs) Yeah. How often do we take our eyes off of Jesus? Because our eyes end up getting fixed on something other than him. We're distracted. We lose sight. We lose focus. So that when we told, we're told that Jesus is crucified at nine o'clock in the morning, there is a written charge above his head that says, this is the king of the Jews. And there's two rebels crucified with him on his right and on his left. <laughs> the same spot where John and James wanted to be. <laughs> there's two rebels crucified, one on the right and one on his left. Where was James and John at, at that time? Where were y'all at? Huh? Jesus right and Jesus is left. They could have been with Jesus in that moment, but they weren't there. They could have died with him on that cross on both sides, but they weren't there. But they abandoned him. And so instead of two rebels were put in their place. So here we have Jesus, the son of God, who who entered history and, and, and died on a cross for the forgiveness of the sins of all of humanity. And he had formed his team of disciples to do this mission with him, to walk this mission out with him. But they turned their backs on him. I'm trying to get y'all to understand. This is your savior. You talk about, hey, they rejected me. They dogging me. They, they, they ain't there for me. Jesus says, I know what that feels like. I done been there. And so here the son of God dying alone, but not entirely because uh, like we just saw, there is uh, there was a new Simon and there's two new rebels with him and the thing that is so challenging about this people God and so challenging about this story for me even as I rehearse it and I preach it I don't care if it's Easter or not Easter I'm talking about I talk about because this is my salvation here that when I start to look at this story for me in fact these three guys Peter James and John (laughs) those three was the closest disciples 
Those three was his inner circle. Those three was the one when, when, when he had to go into the Garden of Gethsemane and he had to decide. He had the others stay right there, but he said, Peter, James, and John, y'all come with me a little closer. Mount Transfiguration wasn't just Peter, but it was also James and John who saw him transform. Listen, y'all, I mean, these are the closest disciples. They did life with Jesus for three years. They learn from him. They walk with him. They talk with him on a daily basis. And here I am in the modern world having this issue. And I'm kind of, of course, where, 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 where out of sight means out of mind. And I'm supposed to keep my eyes fixed on Jesus. It's almost like people, it's amazing how even right now for you, we almost, maybe not y'all, y'all here, talking to those that ain't here. It's almost like we got to do a song and dance just to make sure you get fixated on Jesus. It's like if they couldn't, then what hope is there for me? What hope is there for us that they couldn't stay focused and they were walking with Jesus physically? Bishop, what, 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 what means of it do we have to maintain this? How can we get there and 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 and, and what hope is it for us in a modern world where, where every distraction you can imagine is available at the tips of our fingers? We got a phone here, y'all. That thing is nothing to play with. This thing right here, this thing right here, old folk call it a demon. I'm about, I'm about ready to call them and say the same thing. Listen, y'all. I mean, just Google a search or Amazon purchase away. Huh? I mean, literally everything is at your fingertips. Man, you got not only a phone call, not only do you have text messages, not only do you have a camera, not only do you have a video camera, but you also got the mall right there at your phone. You ain't even got to go to any. You can scroll out on your phone and go to every store you want to go to. You can create yourself a mall and have save apps and say, here's my mall. I'm trying to tell y'all. I mean, here it is, y'all. And now, I mean, you could go do this and, and rush the show, and, and you could keep your eyes fixed on this, or you could put your eyes on him so that you can live an uncluttered pursuit for God's mission. God's mission. Hear me. The one advantage that we have is that we actually know how the story ends. Because what seemed like to everybody else was the darkest moment in history, what seemed like was it, the end for Jesus, was actually the moment that Jesus came into his glory. The moment when Jesus declared who he was by way of getting up from the grave. Because Jesus' crucifixion was actually his coronation of the king of creation because what we know that those disciples and what they did not know that Jesus' crucifixion was not the end of the story <laughs> that's not how the story ends the song says three days later he rose again it was just a pause because three days later he would walk out of his own grave, just like he brought Lazarus out of the grave. He held high in victory, and now, <laughs> as his followers, because of his resurrection from the dead, the Bible says that his spirit is poured out on us. His resurrection power is flowing through our veins. Inviting every single one of us to do what those original disciples could not do. But here's what's beautiful. Here's what's significant. Those three guys, Peter, James, and John, were the three people who were in charge of leading the initial church in the first century. Of taking this movement that Jesus started and expanding it throughout the known world to the point where now today, all of us, Unity Church and Unity Church Online Campus, 
we gather together as followers of Jesus because of the faithfulness of those three men, Peter, James, and John. Today, we understand and honor them because they lived an a uncluttered pursuit of God's mission. Even though it did not happen until Jesus rose from, from the grave. When he fully revealed who it is that he was and, and what it is that he had invited them to be a part of, they got it. They understood it. They embraced it. So how do we, as followers of Jesus, in our modern world, a world full of distractions, a world that's full of everything, how do we live an uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? How do we maintain our focus? We got to do some work. What we have to do? Well, first thing we have to do, we got to throw off everything, yes, that hinders us. Then we have to run our race, yeah, with perseverance, Know it's, knowing that it's going to be some pain on the journey knowing that you're going to deal with some hurt. You're going to deal with rejection. You're going to deal with all of that. And then lastly, we got to fix our eyes on Jesus. There's a lot of things that are going to compete for your attention. Oh, yes. It's a whole lot. Maybe for you, it's, it's your job. You got the pressures and the stress of trying to provide for your family in an economy, in a workplace. That's not really stable, it's not really, you don't have the assurance because you know that your job is not really guaranteed. Maybe for somebody where your home life is, is just chaos. Maybe you got a newborn that you're just trying your best to try to take care of, but it's taking all of your energy just to be present. It's a whole lot. Maybe you got a loved one that's just been diagnosed with some type of real serious illness. You're not sure if you're going to be able to pull through and you're praying and you're begging for God to show up and bring healing to your loved one. But you're really not convinced that he will do it. You're distracted. You got a whole lot of stuff going on. Pandemic and issues. How do we live an uncluttered life while we're in pursuit of God's mission. You know, even those moments, try to keep our eyes fixed on them. We try to keep our eyes focused on them because Jesus is inviting us to do this thing called life and to live this life a better way. How do we, how do we do it? You got to go back to Hebrews chapter 12, verse number one. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded with a great cloud of those who witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Verse number two says, looking unto Jesus. Oh, I love this. The author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross despising the shame 
has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him, the Bible says, who endured such hostility from sinners against himself lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. How do we live? An uncluttered pursuit of God's mission? Throw off everything that hinders you. Run with perseverance. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Watch this. And pay attention to how he lived. Look at what he endured and why he went through what he went through. Just for you. Just for you. <laughs> oh, I can stay focused. I just have to constantly make sure I remind myself This is why I started this. Why? Because he first loved me. He first loved me. And if you can't get that, uh, I don't know what else to say. I'm not James and not John. I'm not looking for a position to sit on the right hand or the left. I know Jesus. Them shoes is too big to feel. I don't want to be Simon Peter to have somebody else in my place doing what was supposed to be my job. I'm going to take up my cross daily. So I'm not focused on everybody else and what they, what they don't have. Listen, 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 I'm focused on Jesus and me loving people and I'm just trying to do his will. Listen, people, God, if you were blessed by that, put some clapping hands in the comments. Let's thank God for what it is that he said tonight. Throw off those things that are hindering you. Push with perseverance. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Listen, right now, God spoke to you. By him speaking to you the way he spoke to you, here's how we stay fixed on, fixed on what it is that he has for us. Let your sacrifice speak right now. Let, let your effort go forth. Sow a seed into my focus. That's what I'm sowing into tonight. Tonight, I'm going to pay my tithes, but I'm going to sow a seed of focus, a financial seed of focus. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it right now. I'm a, a financial seed of focus. I'm going to give knowing that what God is going to do right through here, God, help me to stay focused. Well, Bishop, why does it have to be a seed attached to it? Yes, because oftentimes we misread tithing and we misread offerings. You don't think twice when it comes down to you buying something from Amazon. You don't think twice when it comes to you buying some shoes off of Nike.com. I'm talking about myself. Praise God. Are you hearing me? You don't think twice when it comes down to buying anything that you want desire and like why is God in competition with your desires and likes that's a no brainer for you I'm sowing it to my focus I'm giving uh, you want a physical tangible return oh yeah my focus is going to be physical and tangible and what I love about it I ain't got to wait five to six days of shipping it can happen right now, that when I sow, focus is going to come. Even as much as when you look at the tithing principle, it's a covenant connector. What tithing do? The reason why we pay tithes is because he says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all other things shall be added 
and I pay that tithe and I give that tithe. I'm giving it and it gives me a bird's eye view of where I am financially. Now, I'm not picking like saying, okay, I got to pay this, got to pay that, I got to pay that. Listen, y'all, tithing can literally be messed up by your analytical thinking. You're not fixing your eyes on him. You're fixing your eyes on bills. You're fixing your eyes on problems or issues. Fix your eyes on him and let your tithe be by your faith. Trust him. I'm going to pay this tithe. And I'm believing him that he's going to take care of everything else. I would never be tight-fisted when it comes down to God. I'm going to be fluid. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be committed. I'm going to give to him. So right now, I need you to sow that seed. I need you to do that. You're giving it to God, which then the byproduct is his ministry goes forward. His ministry does things within the community. His ministry operates on a whole nother level to spread God's good news to people who do not even know who he is. This is the platform, and you're a part of it. So, and watch God call you and all that you have to grow. Listen, y'all, I thank God for all of you, and I appreciate y'all so much. Let's be faithful. Let's stay committed. Throw off everything that hinders you. Persevere through the pain. Fix your eyes on Jesus because Jesus is showing us a better way. God bless you all. See you soon. Peace.